Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about what my colleagues and I do. So what I'm going to do today is to just give you a summary, a taste of what we are doing, my colleagues and I. I'm not trying to answer any, any questions, deep questions we might have, but what I'm going to do is to introduce you to modern astronomy, cosmology, and show you that we are indeed living in the golden age of astronomy. So these are a few fundamental questions which we have, which we have had for centuries. And now, only now, we could, uh, we could answer these questions. How the universe started? How the structure and galaxies formed in the universe? Are there other planets like the Earth? Is the universe open or closed? What is the nature of dark energy? What are the first generation of galaxies? And all these are the questions which we could today answer. Not only answer, but most importantly, go and observe. Scientific cosmology, that's understanding the universe, how the universe started and evolved to get to the present state. Started by ancient Greeks, around 500 uh, BC. So what is this? Does anyone know what this is? It's not a star. This, this is our own, our own planet. This is home. This is the Earth. Can you imagine that we are all living here? Seven billion people are living here on this speck of dust floating in the arena of space. We are so lonely living there. And on that, everyone you ever knew, everyone you ever admired, all the philosophers, all the prophets, all the people discoverers you read about, everyone, everyone you could think about lived at some stage on this planet. And this is the Earth. And we are living there. Despite that, despite its small size, we could understand the universe as you shall see later. This is something we have to be proud of yourself. This is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, an image of the universe. And every one of these is a galaxy. A galaxy is, is, contains about 100,000 million stars, like our sun. An average galaxy contains that many stars, 100,000 million stars. And every one of them is, is, is a galaxy. Every one of those small dots is a galaxy containing many millions of stars like our sun. And the reason they are so small, because they are so far away. They are billions and billions of light years away. The whole thing started by ancient Greeks. The first one who started thinking about the universe was Ptolemy. And that was um, that, uh, and he put the Earth at the center of the universe. He thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. Everything was moving around the Earth. And this prevailed for 1,500 years until Copernicus. Copernicus removed the Earth from the center of the universe, put the sun at the center of the universe. Today, we know that's wrong. But imagine 1,700 years of thinking. He proposed something against that. That needs a courage. That's what he did. That the, put the sun at the center of the universe. If I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants, Isaac Newton. And indeed, Newton himself was a giant. He proposed the laws of gravity. We changed our perception of the universe. With that law, we send a shuttle to the space, the third law of Newton. And we go and explore the stars and planets. This is what Newton did. But cosmology, as we know it, modern cosmology, started at the beginning of 20th century. And this is when we started to understand how the universe itself started. Today we know the universe started about 13.6 billion years ago through a big explosion called the Big Bang. And ever since, the universe is expanding. That's the point of the Big Bang, when the universe started. And since then, it's been expanding. And we, we are sitting here looking back in time to the beginning of the universe. That's what my colleagues and I do. How the Big Bang started, we don't know. In the answer to the question of why it happened, I offered a modest proposal that our universe is one of those things which happen from time to time. It, it did happen, yes. It, we wouldn't have been here if it hadn't happened. But today, we could see back in time. We could see to the very beginning. And this is an image taken by a satellite called WMAP. And what it does, uh, COBE and WMAP, 
And what it does, it looks at distribution of radiation at the very early universe, when the universe was 300,000 years old. Imagine the age of the universe is over 13 billion years. And this is 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And every point you see, this distribution, the colors you see, that shows distribution of matter in the universe at that time. That is this matter which grew to produce the galaxies and the stars we see today. These galaxies, these images taken by Hubble, all these galaxies were formed as a result of that mass distribution at the very early universe, at the beginning of the universe. Anyone can make things bigger, more complex, and more incomprehensible. It takes a touch of genius to move in the opposite direction. When you look at the, when you look at the sun, look at the earth, all are based, the motions, all are based on the laws of physics and can be explained very easily. And this is what I find quite amazing. Then, after the beginning, we have the stars and galaxies forming. The first stars and galaxies formed about a billion years after the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. Here, I just uh, take a few minutes to explain what stars and galaxies are. Our sun is an average star. Imagine, our sun is an average star. There are about 100,000 million stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Stars like the sun. Stars evolve and their luminosity changes and eventually die in form of black hole or supernovae. And supernovae explodes, and we shall see later, and produce, distribute heavy elements in the universe, which we have. So these are some star-forming regions in our own galaxy. This is a star cluster. The galaxies contain 100,000 million stars on average. And the whole universe, observable universe, has about 100,000 million galaxies. So think about it, 100,000 million stars in one galaxy, and the whole universe, observable universe, is 100,000 million galaxies. And this is only 4% of the universe we know, we can observe. Galaxies move away from each other. The universe is expanding. And we can see and observe the expansion of the universe. This is an average galaxy, similar to our own Milky Way galaxy. Another galaxy. And the universe contains the observable universe, 100,000 million galaxies. And the entire universe is expanding. The expansion started 13 billion years ago at the time of the Big Bang. Universe contains lots of structure. And at the beginning, it was hot, very hot, millions of degrees. And this is basically depicts the expansion of the universe. If you put a balloon, mark the surface of the balloon, and blow it out, those marked points move away from each other. This resembles the actual universe, if every one of those marks is a galaxy. It doesn't mean we are in a particular part of the universe. Wherever you go in the universe, to whatever galaxy you go, you see the other galaxies moving away. And this is when the expansion of the universe discovered by Edwin Hubble in 1929. This is the original diagram Hubble uh, basically produced. The, size, the, the distance of the galaxies changes with their speed. More, more distant galaxies we go and find, they recede from each other at higher speeds. That's called Hubble law. V is equal to H, R. V, speed of galaxies, are their distance. And H is a constant called Hubble constant. Observing the first galaxies, in order to do that, we have to look back in time. When you go out tonight and look at the sky, essentially you look back in time. When you look at the sun, the sunlight takes eight minutes to get here. So you see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Similarly, if you see a galaxy which is eight million light years away, you see it as it was eight million years ago, not as it is today. So by looking at the sky, you look back in time. If you look back 12 billion years, then you get to the time when galaxies started to form at the beginning of the universe. You can see formation of galaxies. So the only way you need to do that is to just look back in time. And this is what you do with our telescopes. So we are here, the Hubble Space Telescope, and it looks back in time to the most distant reaches of the universe. And by finding the galaxies at these parts, you can start to see the first galaxies, the first stars. You can start to see the process of formation of galaxies. This is a hot topic we are studying today how the first generation of galaxies and stars formed, when did they form, how did they evolve 
through the age of the universe up to here. It isn't sufficient just to want. You have got to ask yourself what you're going to do to get the things you want. You may want many things, but the first question you have to ask, how am I, am I going to achieve this? And these need hard work. This, this needs, needs uh, uh, courage to go and to find the unknown. Hard work needs to, to uh, you need to work hard. One of the images, that in order to find the most distant galaxies, as I said, we have to basically go back in time to the most distant regions of the universe. To do that, Hubble took a picture, one of the most famous pictures, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is the deepest image ever seen by the mankind. This is a result of 400 hours of, of, of observations by the Hubble Space Telescope. And every one of those dots you see is a distant galaxy. With this, you reach the edge of the observable universe. You can see galaxies as they form. And this takes us to 13 billion years back in time when the galaxies started to form. And this is, for example, this red one is one of the galaxies which formed. That's one of the first generation of galaxies which was formed. A few, a few months ago, we found, my colleagues and I, found one of the most distant galaxies ever seen. Probably the most distant galaxy. And that's the galaxy, and you can see it here. This is the galaxy. And this is, is basically was formed about 600 million years after the beginning of the universe, after the Big Bang. It's about 13 billion years uh, ago. And the distance to this is about 13 uh, billion light years. So the light we see from this left this galaxy 13 billion years ago, when the Earth, the Sun, and nothing had happened, had, 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 had been formed. And just to prove that I'm right, this is how we made the discovery. This is the spectrum, and by looking at different lines on the spectrum, they shift to the infrared, to the red, to longer wavelengths as galaxies recede from us. And by identifying the lines and knowing what line it is, then we could understand and we could work out the distance to the galaxy. Failing is bad, but worse is not trying to succeed. There are lots of failures in doing so, but sometimes we succeed. If we, if we, if we don't try, we never succeed. And this is my message to you. It's fine if you fail, but it's not fine if you don't try to succeed. Galaxies form, and this is the process of formation of galaxies from the very beginning to where we are today. Galaxies merge, collide, and produce bigger and bigger galaxies throughout the age of the universe. These are kind of galaxies which merge throughout the history of our universe. As we look back in time, we find these galaxy mergers. Now we need to observe the universe. Measure what's measurable, and make measurable what is not so. A scientist works with measurements, with numbers. Something without numbers means nothing. And for astronomers, those numbers come by observations with telescopes. And this is our tool, observations. Measure what's measurable, and make measurable what is not so. And this is Hubble Space Telescope going around the Earth every, every hour. It's just, just over an hour once going around the Earth. 300 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere. And with that, we have revolutionized astronomy. And these pictures are all taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. We work every day with these pictures. We are insignificant beings living on a small planet of a very average star and yet understand the universe. This is by itself something. We have to be proud of ourselves to be able to know that much detail about the universe, despite being so small, on a small planet, which I just showed you how small we are. And we live in the universe. We know there is life in the universe. And the life in the universe was produced by generation of heavy elements. The heavy elements, which we are all made up of, are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. These were all cooked in the stars through stellar evolution. When the stars die, they, they, they end up in supernova explosions. By that explosion, these heavy elements basically scatter in the, in the space. And eventually, they form life somewhere which could support life. And our colleagues are looking for planets which support life. There are satellites up there which are looking for some stars which are like Earth. And they have found some of those stars. 
And with those stars, the next step is to see if they have the elements which we need for life in those stars. Today, it's over 500 stars like the Earth are discovered. So some of those may be in a stage, primitive stages of life development. A person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. You learn by your mistakes. The problem is when you, start, when you repeat these mistakes you made. If you learn from a mistake and do not make that mistake again, make other mistakes, that's fine. This is the learning process. All of us have gone through and will go through. Content of the universe. What does uh, the universe, what's the most prominent element, things in the universe? So what we see in the universe is only 4% of the entire universe. It's about 96% of the universe cannot be seen. Out of this 96%, about 23% is in the form of dark matter, which we have some idea of what it is. However, 73% is in the form of dark energy, which we have no idea what it is. This is embarrassing that we don't know about 70% of the content of our universe. We don't even know about that 23%. We could just speculate about that. All we know and all I talked about is only 4% of the entire universe. Now, this is very important because this basically tells us whether our universe is open or closed. It's competition, as you shall see, between dark matter and dark energy. The universe is expanding. The question is, at some point, does this expansion stop and the universe collapse on itself? Or does the expansion goes forever? Is the universe going to expand forever or stop because of the force of the gravity and collapse on itself, starting another Big Bang? That's the question which has recently been answered. These are three types of the universe, the closed universe and an open universe. This is the future of the universe. Dark matter produces gravity. Gravity is an attractive force, so it basically keeps everything together, attracts the, the gravity is produced by matter, and that attracts everything, the galaxies. And this could lead to the universe being, being, uh, being closed, basically stop the expansion of the universe and a contraction following it. So today, we have been able to measure that force of gravity through a process I, I don't have time to go through is gravitational lensing. We can measure the mass of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and from that constrain the amount of dark matter which we have in the universe. All these, all these features you see here, these are gravitationally lensed objects taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. By measuring the size of these, the, we, could, we could measure what the, uh, the, the amount of dark matter in the universe and if that's sufficient to close the universe. And this is an image of the dark matter distribution in the universe that a few years ago we find that through a survey we did with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is distribution of dark matter as changed with redshift. Redshift is basically a measure of distance. We go to the depth of the universe. But the, 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 the mysterious force in the universe containing 70% of the universe is dark energy. And this is really mysterious. But important result is that the, 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 the competition between the gravity and anti-gravity produced by dark energy leads to the future destiny of the universe. So if 70% of the universe is dark energy, and dark energy produces a repulsive force, basically matter repels, basically that causes the universe to expand faster. That accelerates the rate of expansion of the universe. So that is 70%, that's 20%, 23%. So from this, we conclude that dark energy wins, which means over dark matter. It's more dark energy, which means that the acceleration increases with time, which means the universe is likely to be open, expanding forever. There is one thing stronger than all the armies of the world. That's an idea whose time has come. Many years ago, we didn't know about this. But today, we know what happened. If someone had told me this when I was a graduate student, I would not have believed it. But today, I do, because I see the data, I see the, the investigations, I see what, what, what people have done. So based on that, it's really that that's true statement by Isaac Newton. There is one thing stronger than all the armies of the world. That's an idea whose time has come. And briefly, the future research. So as I said, we are in golden age of cosmology. And the only limit to our realization of tomorrow 
will be doubt of today. If we don't doubt today, we can't discover tomorrow. That's the first step. Based on that, we go and discover. It took us, it took Copernicus 1,500 years to remove the Earth from the center of the universe, put Sun at the center of the universe. It took us 100 years to go from here to there. 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, people made, Wright brothers, made the first plane. And 100 years after that, we flew on space shuttle. This is the speed with which we are progressing, we are moving. We, 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 use, the, we use the shuttle, the most complex instrument, ever, the most complex vehicle ever built, to repair the Hubble, the most complex instrument ever we had. And with that, we looked at the depth of the universe. Today, we have the largest telescopes, the Keck telescopes in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. With that, we could look at the depth of the universe. Next week, I'm going there. I'm going to use these telescopes to look, to search for the first generation of galaxies found. So this is the progress we are making. We put satellites in space. With those, we look at the depth of the universe. We discover new things. And the next generation of telescopes, James Webb Space Telescope, that's successor to the Hubble. Six and a half meter telescope. It's about over nine times the collecting power of the Hubble Space Telescope. And with this, we could really see the depth of the universe. This would be put in a few years' time, we put that in the orbit, Lagrangian 2 orbit, which is an orbit, the gravity of the Earth, Moon, and the Sun cancel each other. And from that, we could see the depth of the universe. This is how we go. And the next generation of ground-based telescope is the 30-meter telescopes, which we are in the process of planning it. And this is one kind of 30-meter telescope, which is going to be located in Hawaii in 2018. The size of the mirror is 30 meter, and with this, you could go even deeper and see the galaxies when they formed, the first generation of galaxies. There is no limit to our realization of tomorrow. The only thing we need to do is to start questioning ourselves, asking questions and pondering the questions and going about to find those questions. This is what makes life so exciting. The purpose of life is life with a purpose. Remember that. Thank you.